Morgan is a 23-year-old university student who drinks a few beers per week. Recently, Morgan has begun taking cocaine over the weekend. They achieve good grades, earn a modest but comfortable wage and have good relationships with family and friends. A recent doctor's visit reported that they're in good health. Sam is retired and feels unfulfilled with life. Sam has begun drinking vodka from a water bottle throughout the day. Sam feels ashamed and guilty about this behaviour and has tried unsuccessfully to cut down. Sam doesn't feel that they'd be able to cope without the alcohol, but their consumption is within the recommended four standard drinks per day and they are otherwise in good physical health. Do Sam or Morgan have a problem with substance use? Have a think while we play the music. If you think all the way back to the first week of lectures, DSM-5 defines abnormality based on a range of factors, the most common being distress and disability. How upsetting is the behaviour for the person or those around them and how much does the disorder interfere with the person's everyday functioning and relationships? With Morgan's situation, although they're engaged in illegal activity, they are unlikely to meet the diagnostic criteria for substance abuse. Sam, on the other hand, may meet the criteria for mild alcohol use disorder. One important point to recognise is that before any psychological disorder can be diagnosed, the mental health professional must first rule out the possibility that the symptoms displayed are being caused by substance use. Remember when we went over the DSM criteria for a major depressive episode? The manual explicitly states the symptoms must not be due to the physiological effects of a substance. And this is because, by definition, a substance affects our physiology, behaviour, thoughts and or emotions. And this is because drugs work by altering the way that neurons fire they affect the brain at a neural level. Substances fall into five main categories. Depressants such as alcohol, barbiturates and benzodiazepines like Valium. Stimulants like amphetamines and methamphetamines, caffeine, cocaine and nicotine. Opiates like opium, heroin, morphine and codeine as well as their synthetic cousins, the opioids like hydromorphone. The opiates are most commonly used as analgesics. The painkillers to you and me. Hallucinogens like cannabis, LSD, magic mushrooms and ketamine. And finally, other drugs of abuse such as inhalants and steroids. These drug categories are reflected in the subcategories of substance abuse contained in DSM-5. But for the purpose of this course, we're going to focus mainly on the general factors that all substance abuse disorders have in common. So when does someone go from substance use to substance abuse? Is intentionally getting drunk considered abuse? What about accidentally drinking more than you intended to? Like on multiple occasions? Mental health and drug and alcohol workers recognise that there are different levels of involvement. Substance use is defined as the ingestion of a substance in a way that doesn't affect social or occupational functioning. From a diagnostic perspective at least, no distinction would be made between having a cup of coffee with friends and snorting cocaine a few times a year at parties so long as these behaviours had no adverse effects. The next level of involvement is intoxication and this is pretty much what you think it is. Intoxication is when the type of drug and or the amount that is ingested affects a person's thought, moods, judgement and or motor control. Finally, substance abuse occurs when a person's life is being negatively affected by their drug use. A person's ability to work or study might be affected. Their relationships with family and friends might be affected. They might spend so much of their income on drugs that they're unable to afford to pay their rent or buy food. The DSM criteria for substance abuse disorders states that the pattern of drug use must cause clinically significant distress or impairment with at least two of the following symptoms being present within a 12 month period. The symptoms include the substance being taken in larger amounts than intended or for a longer period of time than intended. The person has a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to reduce or control their drug use. 
a significant amount of time is dedicated to acquiring the drug, taking the drug and or recovering from its effects. The person experiences intense cravings. The drug use interferes with the person's ability to fulfill their obligations at work, home or school. And if this happens, the person then continues to use the drug even though these social and occupational breakdowns are occurring. The person might give up important social, occupational or recreational activities so that they can take the drug. They may repeatedly use that drug in situations that are physically hazardous and despite knowing that their physical and or mental condition is being negatively affected, they continue the pattern of drug use. Lastly, and probably most importantly, the person usually experiences tolerance and or withdrawal. Tolerance is defined as needing to take more of the drug to experience the same effect, or taking the same amount of the drug, but its effects are reduced. Withdrawal we'll go into in a bit more detail in the next lecture, but it's characterized by physical symptoms like shaking, feeling like your skin's crawling, inability to regulate your body temperature, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and psychological symptoms like anxiety and irritability. Having experienced opiate withdrawal firsthand after spinal surgery, I can tell you that these symptoms feel unbearable and they do not let up, not even for a moment, for days. It's not a nice feeling wanting to peel off your own skin in the hope that it will stop the crawling. Now it may come as a surprise, or maybe not. In Australia, the risk of harm from substances is not reflected in their legal status. In a worldwide study conducted by the Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs, alcohol was found to be the most damaging drug to both the individual and to society. In Australia, when we compare the disease burden of tobacco, alcohol and illicit drugs together, it paints a very interesting picture. In 2016, tobacco use accounted for 9% of Australia's total burden of disease with 80% of all lung cancers being caused by smoking. Alcohol accounted for 5% of Australia's burden of disease with drink driving causing about a third of all injuries to people in cars and nearly a quarter of people who had committed suicide or self-harmed had been drinking alcohol at the time. On the other hand, when the stats from all illicit drugs were pulled together, this still only accounted for 1.8% of Australia's total burden of disease. This effect has been mainly driven by drugs being injected, opioid use, cocaine and amphetamine use, and cannabis dependence. Let's take a look at these stats in a bit more detail. The Australian 2016 National Drug Strategy Household Survey reported that rates of smoking have been declining in this country since 1991, but this rate has slowed over the past three years. This may be due to a number of factors. Maybe the ad campaigns are no longer having the impact that they once did, or maybe as a country, we're approaching the floor effect or the lowest rate that we can reasonably be expected to achieve. This seems to be at least partly the case with at least a third of smokers stating that they have no desire to quit. With regards to alcohol, 80% of adults have consumed alcohol in the last 12 months and half of these people have taken measures to reduce their consumption. About a quarter of current drinkers have been victims of an alcohol-related incident in 2016 alone. About one in six had put themselves or someone else at risk of harm whilst under the influence again just in 2016 alone. And roughly 10% of these drinkers had caused an actual injury to themselves or to someone else at some point in their lives due to the direct effects of alcohol. When it comes to illicit drugs, our attitudes are changing, with more people supporting education and harm minimisation strategies and fewer supporting law enforcement strategies. The fact that nearly half of all Australians have used illicit drugs at least once in their lives is likely to contribute at least partly to those attitudes. Roughly one in eight Australians reported using illicit drugs at least once in the last 12 months, and one in 20 reported misusing prescription drugs in the same time. Probably not surprisingly, the most commonly used illicit drugs were cannabis, cocaine, ecstasy, 
amphetamines and methamphetamines respectively. Party drugs like ecstasy and cocaine were used relatively infrequently, whereas cannabis and methamphetamines were used weekly or more often. Amphetamine and methamphetamine users were mainly using ice. Back in 2010, only about one in five of this population selected ice as their drug of choice. In 2016, this jumped to nearly 60%. The incidence of daily meth use has also doubled during this period. Previously, meth use was a bit like ecstasy in that it was being used only occasionally. Now it's a bit more like cannabis and being taken regularly. But it's important to keep in mind that meth users make up only a very small percentage of the population. Only 1.4% of Australia's total population currently uses meth and this has fallen significantly from previous years. So who are the people who are using these drugs? In the 2016 report, people who identify as gay, lesbian and bisexual were nearly six times more likely to use ecstasy or methamphetamines than heterosexuals. And people who live in remote and very remote areas of the country, people who are unemployed and Indigenous Australians were more likely to report smoking and illicit drug use. What I find really interesting is that when you compare the 2016 report to previous years, levels of psychological distress has increased in both drug users and non-drug using populations. Basically, we're all more stressed out and feeling like we can't cope. Amphetamine and methamphetamine users had the highest incidence of serious mental health issues, with a whopping 37% of users reporting high or very high levels of psychological distress. This is compared to just 10% of non-drug users. Now, it's important to remember that this is all correlational research, so we don't know what's causing these trends. Do drugs cause psychological distress? Well, they don't seem to be because non-drug users also reported increased distress during the same time period. But there is the possibility that drugs and or the drug taking environment could potentially compound this background stress that everyone is feeling. Or maybe some other factor is causing them to feel this stress more and they're just using drugs and self-medicating to help them cope. Thanks for watching. In this video, we've looked at different types of substances, levels of involvement from substance use to intoxication and clinical substance abuse disorders, the DSM-5 criteria that are shared across most of the substance abuse disorders, the disconnect between harm and legality, and the nature of substance use and abuse in Australia. In the next video, I'll take you through some of the risk factors and the scientific models that account for substance use disorder and phenomena like withdrawal symptoms. I think you'll find them really interesting. In a worldwide study, com in a worldwide study conducted by the independent scientific community, in a study conduct, oh, I can't speak.